Hey guys, National Master James Canty III here with Chess.com, and today we have member game analysis. Now before we get started, make sure you guys submit your games. Click on the link right under the video. Submit your games and hopefully yours will be chosen for some member game analysis. So I worked hard on this study for you guys today, and we're actually going to go over some points. So number one, what we're going to go over first is strike in the center whenever possible. You got to know that the center is the center of the board is very important. We all know that. So you need to know when to strike in the center of the board and why it's very important. Small problems become big ones later. So you have to strike in the center whenever possible. Number two is checking your options. Usually in any position, there's usually a few options. You kind of want to dumb it down to two options after you look at a, a few things. Two options is really good. But which one is more comfortable? Which one makes the most sense? And we're going to talk about that. Number three is loose pieces. Quotation marks. What is a loose piece and how it affects your games and etc. Now, today's member is 21 Ashish. So, hey, your game was chosen. So thank you for submitting it. Now, let's get right into it. 21 Ashish, you played the black pieces here in what we have a French defense. This is a very strong opening. I love the French defense. I grew up on it. Um, I am now a Sicilian player against E4, but the French is so solid. So nice. Played at the grandmaster level. So very, very nice. E4, E6, E5. This is a weird move, I would say, because it's kind of pushing the same pawn twice. And uh, it's kind of like going with one piece over into the wilderness or the jungle is what I like to say. He's crossing the line. And what line am I talking about? Where four through one is all white. So that means for black, anything five through eight is all for black. So when anything crosses the line, they immediately have to go. And I'm not a fan of keeping stuff um, in my territory for, for long at all. So this is just not a move I recommend at all. Actually, the French move should be D4. It should be D4 here. And we go into a standard French defense where it could be many, many lines from here. So after E5, there uh, after E5, C5 was played. This is a very interesting move. And it also could be transposed or a transposition. Um, could happen after the move D5 here. And then after D5, white could play D4. And this looks like a French advanced variation. Well, black now plays C5. And we have now transposition into a position that everyone really knows, or a lot of people do know, which is the French advanced um, position here. And I favor black with this opening at that point. So now this leads us to our first point. C5 is a good move. But when you find a good one, look for a better one. You want to strike in the center. C5 is not technically a center move. It's kind of off center just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just a smidge. But... If we strike in the center now, d5 is such a good move. Why is it such a good move? Because we keep a pawn in the center immediately, and we, we claim our stake in the center. We're saying that we have a center too. This is what we want, and we want to have some of the center as well. The center is these four squares. So if you are new to chess and you don't know what we're talking about, the four squares, the center of the board, these are the most important squares on the board, especially in the beginning parts of the game. So d5 makes more sense than c5. c5 is a good move. Again, when you find a good move, look for a better one. And also, let's say he makes a random move. Not random, but if he goes knight f3 here, and let's try d5 now. What's the difference? Well, the difference is now he can en passant. That is a move. En passant. And after bishop takes, these pawns are now separated. So you kind of don't have two pawns in the center. You kind of have like one and a half in a way. It's not. A, it's better to have two in the center. So well, what if we go d5 immediately? Let's do the same moves here. d5. Knight f3, and actually, sorry, not knight f3, d5, he en passants, and then we take with this pawn. Now we have two pawns in the center, and these guys are going to be walking next to each other all the way up the board, having a great old time here. And it would be much better than just having them separated like we had before. So going back to this, we should always strike in the center whenever possible. It's very nice to do that So because small problems become big ones later, and as we see, this d-pawn should have been pushed early on. So c5 was played. Then we have c4, uh, kind of an awkward move as well. Then you have knight to c6. Beautiful move. Knight c6 is beautiful. It attacks that weak pawn that's on e5 that came out here by himself being a strong pawn, saying that I'm super pawn or whatever he wanted to say. He wanted to stay out here by himself, but now he has to, to uh, be attacked and he has to try to figure out how to protect himself. And after that, knight f3 was played, defending the pawn. Very nice move. It does defend it. But, of course, if we keep putting pressure on this pawn, he's probably going to fall eventually. So, 
G6 was played. Very nice move. I like this move a lot. I'm a G6 player myself um, with the black pieces. I love putting my bishop on the fin shadow or the, the, uh, the long diagonal here. I love having that. Very nice. So my next move here would immediately be bishop to G7, putting more pressure on this weak pawn in the center. After that, we have d4. So this is just not a good move. d4 is not good at all. And uh, it just shows that white doesn't know what's going on with the center. And actually, black made a very nice move here with pawn takes d4, removing the defender of the e5 pawn. After knight takes, whoa, hold up. What just happened? The knight move that was defending this pawn, now taking it to the center. Doesn't that mean this pawn is hanging? 1000% correct. That is right. Knight takes e5, and now we go up a pawn out of nowhere, and we're completely winning with the black pieces on move 6 already. This is a very, very good, good position here. Very good position. Bishop to f4 was played, and here goes our first surprise right here, or big, big surprise from black here, with the bishop to d6 move. Whoa, what just happened? What is bishop d6? Why is this such a weird move? Well, a few things. Number one, I always like to talk about consistency. Consistency means in chess, if I'm going to play g6, then that means my bishop should probably go to g7. Vice versa, if I'm going to go b6, my bishop should probably sit on b7. So if, if I'm going to play this kind of move, I need to follow up. It's always about follow-up. Follow-up is very big in chess, and consistency um, is part of that. So putting his bishop here makes way more sense than putting it here. What's the problem with putting it on d6? Well, I tell all the beginner students and people who are just starting chess, this is really bad because imagine, remember, strike in the center whenever possible. So if we imagine this, let's put our thinking caps on and imaginations. If the pawn was on d5, then this wouldn't be such a bad move. But because this is this is the pawns on d7 the problem is that we cannot get this bishop out and if we go back okay how many moves does it take for this bishop to get out one and two d5 and bishop d7 so if we go bishop d6 it now takes three moves for the same thing to happen we have to move this bishop then move this pawn then move this bishop, which wastes time. And time is huge in chess. You can lose from one move. We all know that. We all probably lost from one move before. We know how that works. But we want to limit those kind of moves. And it, and it goes into like you want to make you know the easier of the two. You did have bishop d6. Yes, that's an option. But you want to make sure you're checking your options. I do have bishop d6. I also have d6. I also have bishop g7, which is staying consistent and following what we did anyway. And bishop g7 is the, just the best move here. So after bishop to d6, which is played in the game, queen to e2, he now puts pressure on this knight. Now, I'm a tactics guy. I do love tactics. And something like knight takes c4 would jump out and be pretty cool here. Because if knight takes c4, we have bishop takes d6. Followed by knight takes d6. Only thing is that he does have this in-between move, queen e5, which really sucks after hitting both of these pieces here. And we're going to go down some material, which is pretty rough there. So black plays queen a5 check. Very nice. He's actually checking and defending at the same time here. Knight to d2 was played. Now we do have a move that we could play. Very kind of hard to see move here. But knight to d3 check. It just relieves the pin here. And if the queen takes or king moves, we can take bishop takes on f4. So queen takes d3 and bishop takes f4. And we're doing totally fine here with the black pieces. No issues anymore. No pins and no pressure. So going back to knight to d2. After knight d2, we have bishop to c7. So bishop to c7 kind of moves it out of the way. But again, going back to checking your options, man. Bishop to c7, we had to move it two times when a bishop could have sat very comfortably on the g7 square. And we could worry about other parts of the game as opposed to moving this bishop around so many times. So bishop takes e5. That was a wow move. Very unexpected. You want to keep the pressure as much as you can. And white just taking this uh, relieves a lot of pressure for black. So bishop takes e5. I'm actually even not a fan of giving up the two bishops, giving up a bishop pair. A bishop pair is very huge. All grandmasters or most will tell you that bishops are usually a little bit better than knights, even though they're worth three points, both of them, right? So bishops are a little bit better, I would say. So I'm giving up two bishops, and now as with the black pieces, I have the bishop pair. When the game starts to open up, the bishops are going to be monsters when white is only left with one bishop and we have two. So b4 was played. This was a very strong and interesting move here. You're asking yourself, why doesn't he just take it? Queen takes b4. Makes a lot of sense. Queen takes b4, but it just loses to queen takes e5. Ouch, that's just not a move. It wouldn't be fun. So you made the right move here. 21 Ashish plays queen to c7. He defends his bishop here, also keeping his pin nice and strong here. But then white plays 
This nice move, knight b5, hitting the queen, saying, you can take my rook, I dare you. You're going to take my queen with check, and then he's going to actually take the rook to follow. And black can just resign at that point. Queen to b8, this is a very interesting move, but actually the only move to actually protect this and also keep this. Um, keep this under wraps or keep it under control and also putting your queen somewhere else. So when they cross the line, meaning pieces, when your opponent's pieces cross the line, they have to go. So automatically, I'm, I'm already thinking a6. This knight has to go because my queen is hindered because of it. My pieces are all jambled up. So a6 has to be played. So let's see what happens actually. Rook to b1 and there it is. 21 Ashish agrees. a6. You got to get rid of this knight. And the knight goes to a3. Knights on the rim are dim or grim. And he only has one square to go to. So this knight's really bad, by the way. After that, we go knight to f6. Knight f6 is good. I like better moves like knight to e7. Why? Because you want to keep this diagonal open. You want to keep this open just in case. If there was a move like knight to f3, putting some extra pressure on his bishop here, if that were to happen, I could just nicely bring it back home and tuck it in right here and it's still doing the same thing it was doing on e5 and then i can castle and not have to worry about really anything and i'm just up a clear pawn here and i should win this game quite easily but with knight to f6 knight f6 it is a development move but it's kind of an awkward development move as it just blocks my bishop's range here and uh it's kind of it's kind of weird because these are are very um very weak squares. If my queen, if white's queen is able to penetrate these squares, it could be very bad and devastating at some points of the game. So let's see what happened. Knight to f3. That's exactly what he played. Hitting this. But then you found a nice move. Check. Uh-oh. Check. Either you're moving the king or you're bringing that knight right back to where it was a move ago. And he brings the knight right back. And then that gives you the opportunity to move your queen to a better square. That's very, very, very awesome. Putting your queen on a better square. Your king still needs to castle so we can finish development here. Rook to b3. He's threatening this bishop. He's like, this bishop has to go. When they cross the line, you got to go. So that's what he's saying here. Rook b3. He's like, oh, you got to get out of here. Hey, we can't have him here. And after bishop takes b4, you're now up a second pawn, which is going to lead into some decisive results. And then the third, oh my goodness, gave up another pawn here. Queen takes c5, knight to b1. Black is winning in every area here. All we have to do is just develop our pieces and castle. And I'm going to tell you, you guys are in for a surprise. This is the craziest game I have seen in a long time. So hold on and buckle up. So bishop takes d2 and then knight takes d2. We also have check on a back rank. That is a move. There are many moves here for black. But then we make this really, 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 really bad move. B5. Oh my goodness. We could have played almost anything else really. Now, of course, luckily there are some other moves that could have been played after white's next move. Queen F3. And this leaves us to our third point. Loose pieces. What is a loose piece, you ask? A loose piece is any piece that is undefended. They always say there's a saying out there that loose lips sink ships. You can Google it if you heard it, if you never heard it before, but I've heard it and didn't know what it was. And uh, but now I know what it was, what it is related to chess. Loose lips sink ships, but loose pieces lose games. So if you have a loose piece, which is a piece that is undefended, you have a loose piece, you're probably going to get in some trouble one way or another if you don't protect that piece. And what are the loose pieces here? Let's go back a move. What is the loose piece in black's position? I'll give you a second to think about that. And there's the second. It's up. So it, it is the knight. If you chose the knight, you are correct. It's the knight on f6. It's the piece that's undefended. The queen can take care of herself in a way. And sometimes there are tactics on the queen being a loose piece, but not, not too much. But this knight is a loose piece, which means it is undefended. So maybe a move like castle or knight d5 or even queen back to e7 just, just to sit and defend this will be nice. But after b5, white finds a very nice find here with queen to f3 as he hits both loose pieces. Whoa, that's two of them. We, I thought we only had one loose piece. Well, we actually have two. And the queen is able, it's very good at letting you know that you have two loose pieces or you're missing some things or you can't cover both is what he's saying. But black does have a move here. And black actually played rook b8, which is just not the best move. It actually loses. Um, but knight d5. Knight d5 was the only move that blocked both pieces. It actually blocks the rook. Uh, it blocks the connection for the queen to get to the rook. And uh, the knight is now protected. Now, the issue is this piece is really, really weak. Or the square is really, really weak. And a lot of things could happen. Um, knight e4 will prob probably be the best move. And maybe we can check the king here. And keep things rolling. We're still doing good as black here. 
But for us to give up this piece is just giving up the game. And that goes back to, again, make sure, try to stay away from loose pieces. Because if you got loose pieces, you're going to lose the game a lot of times if you're not paying attention. Rook b8, queen takes f6. That makes a lot of sense. He had to. Queen to c1 check. We have king e2. He steps out of the way. And then we play rook f8. Again, we could have castled and got out of the way here. Just getting out of the way, making that king safe, and also bringing a rook into the game. Rook f8, the problem I don't like about this move is that it keeps the king in the center. And as we see, this is literally the craziest game I've saw all day. And it's going to be very, very, very wild. And we're going to see how black wins this game. You said, what, win? Yes, black wins this game. Somehow, some way. Check this out. This is going to be awesome. Queen c4 check. He hits him here, but also a double attack with the knight um, here. So he goes king f3. There's a king on f3. What a game, right? This is here. I'm immediately probably going um, after my queen moves. So queen c6 and bishop b7 is already popping out. Queen to c6 looks good as we defend here. Um, we actually uh, defend the king and uh, with from this square because that's checkmate if the knight's able to get here and also ready to pin the knight as well. So rook to c3 was played. After rook c3, we have queen b6 just stepping out of the way. And then bishop to d3, he gets his last piece out. We play bishop b7 to keep this knight under wraps because you have to. Then white comes in with the double up. It looks like all hope is lost here for black. You will be surprised how crazy this game is gets and unfolds this is just the beginning so after bishop takes e4 we have bishop takes e4 right back then we have d5 looks like yeah this should be out after rook check probably not actually and it was but of course there was not enough precision here by white and that's okay of course we're not computers so white was not precise enough which actually uh caused him to lose this game surprisingly rook check after rook check we have king d7 now, we looks like one of the rooks are hanging. Actually, they're not. What's funny is they both protect each other. So after rook check here, oh my goodness, this should be resignable. But uh, 21, as she says, resign. That's not a word. I don't know what that is. Then he plays king d6. Very nice. Look at the king walk. Taking a walk with the king in the park here. Okay, so queen e7 check. Looks like it's all over. Lights out. King e5. What? There's a king on e5 and a king on f3. And there's no mate in sight right now. Now, he plays queen g5 check, and then 21 Ashish plays f5. What a move. Oh my goodness, what is going on? f5 is so cool here because king can step back. He's blocking the check here. This is still under wraps here. I mean, the, the rooks are hanging like it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. And then after queen g3 check, we have king to e5. There is a king on e5. I'm sorry, d4. There's a king on d4. The king stepped from e5 to d4. Can you believe this? And black won this. Wow. Shout out to 21 Ashish. We have rook to c6 was played. Then we take this with check. Very nice. Now we're back in the game. As surprising and crazy as this game is, the material is now even. So now let's look at this again. King to e2. We play queen a5, threatening queen takes a2 check. Check him here. King goes back to e5. The king started on e8, ended up on d4, and now walking back like nothing happened. What a game here, guys. Queen to c5 check. King to f4. Man, king on f4. g3 check. King to g4. Queen takes rook. Now we're just down a rook. But how did we win? Let's see. Okay, queen takes a2. So maybe we can get a perpetual or something. But then white makes a fatal error here and plays rook to c2. Can you find the next move for 21 Ashish here? I'll give you a second. That is correct. Queen takes c2. Queen takes c2. Check. Rook takes and rook takes queen. Oh my goodness. This is a wild game. Now black has two pass pawns. Two connected pass pawns by just to say, because this is you can't stop both of these, especially with the rook behind them. It's going to be a disaster. One of these are going to queen. Watch the rest of this game. Rook c6. He has king to h3. Really not a move he should have made. Actually, you want to focus when you have pass pawns, you got to push them. Aaron Nimza, which says that in my system. So if you have my system, it's a great read. It's very, very difficult sometimes, but it does talk about some very key points as in like pass pawns must be pushed. So if you got pass pawns, you got to push them. This move is not, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Just do everything else. Rook takes a, a6 and so now he takes the best pawn or one of the best. 
King takes, Rook takes, and Rook B8. We should have been played this move, but that's okay. Now we're able to walk this through or try to win some of these. And we also have some more pass pawns that help us out as well. So Rook to uh, E7. We have H5 is on the board now. Rook to G7. And then we start pushing that pass pawn. Uh-oh. If he can't get back in time, it is going to be over. So pass pawns must be pushed. We probably should have pushed this one again, but that's okay. Rook to G5. And then you play B3. Rook takes and then king to g4 rook f4 king g5 rook takes and b2 and this is not being stopped not being stopped at all and i know white is, is shaking his head hands on his head like this like what happened is this even real what year is it basically like it's it's, it's crazy that he went from winning to like, wow, and this is so good on 21 Ashish to keep playing, and I know there's a big smile on his face as he queens this pawn right here with queen here. Then he follows up with a very nice and nasty check here as there's no way to defend against the, the threats of mate here. And then after king f1, rook check, and that's checkmate. Clap, clap it up. That is an awesome game. Wow, 21 Ashish. That was the craziest game I've ever saw all day today. It was pretty, pretty cool there. Now, going back to our summary today, guys, if you're able to strike the center in the beginning again, if you're able to strike the center, you have to do it because you may not have another chance. If you may not, if you don't have another chance, you got to strike that center. You have to, like you have to, number one. Number two is there's usually two options in every position. So a lot of times you have to dumb them down to two options. When you get those two options, which one makes the most sense? Then you want to use those because, of course, bishop d6, like we played early on, wasn't too good. But bishop g7, it was consistent, and it made the most sense. So you want to do that. And number three is loose pieces lose games. Every time you got those loose pieces, they're going to lose games a lot of times. So you got to make sure you keep your pieces defended nice and tight and together with nice chemistry from there. So that's today's member game analysis. Shout out to 21 Ashish. Thank you so much, guys, for hanging out. I hope you uh, you guys learned a lot today. And before we get out of here, make sure you submit your game so hopefully yours are chosen for some member game analysis. Once again, I'm National Master James Canty III with Chess.com. Thank you so much. I'll see you on the next one.